who is going to win the battle for the belt? Will it be the visiting Troy Trojans or will it be the homestanding South Alabama Jaguars? Welcome in to the Philip Jordan Podcast. I am your host, Philip Jordan, philosopher on college football, 96.9 The Legend in Dothan, Alabama, where I'm the in-studio host and producer of the Woods Football and also host of Talking SEC. We are previewing the Troy-South Alabama matchup that is going down tonight. So this podcast is dropping on Thursday morning. So tonight on ESPNU, 6.30 Central Time, the Troy Trojans will be playing South Alabama. And to preview this big matchup in the Sun Belt, I'm going to be joined by the voices of the two teams, Barry McKnight, voice of the Troy Trojans, and J.D. Byers, voice of the South Alabama Jaguars. They will be joining me two separate interviews uh, to give – the side for their team. So very excited about that. And it should be a lot of fun. Then at the end of the show, after you hear both from Barry McKnight and from J.D. Byers, I will give my pick on who will win the battle for the belt. Before we do all that, let you guys know you can find me in the podcast. You can find me on social media at P. Jordan SCC. Podcast is available on all your favorite podcast platforms, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeart, wherever you get your podcast, the Philip Jordan Podcast is there if you're on apple podcast please follow rate and review leave a review i will read it on a future edition of the show you can also check out the show over on youtube the philip jordan youtube channel you subscribe button hit the bell for all notifications if you leave a comment on a video i'll read that on a future edition as well you can always email me at sports talk philip jordan at gmail.com now let's get things off let's preview first the visiting troy trojans with the voice of the trojans Barry McKnight. Everybody joining me first, the team that will be traveling to Mobile, uh, Barry McKnight, voice of the Troy Trojans. He joins right now. Uh, You can also listen to him Monday through Friday from 7 to 10 a.m. over on Sports Radio 740 in Montgomery, uh, the Budweiser Sports Line. Uh, Barry, it is is good to talk to you, and I'm very excited about this game on Thursday night. I'm very excited as well. I cannot wait for it. It is a – it's a challenge on a Thursday game. But a Thursday road game brings its own set of challenges. I have been elbow deep in all of the preparation and getting everything ready for it. I want to make sure I'm prepared for the radio broadcast because it is a big, big football game, Philip. Yeah, you know, and that was one of the questions I wanted to ask you, especially with, you know, you being the voice of the team that's traveling to Mobile. And I asked this on my high school football podcast a lot when I have a coach on. I say, how what's the preparation change for a Thursday game? So uh, for a broadcaster – what does it change for your your week? Well, it's just compacted. It, you know, I, I have always been very uh, disciplined in in my preparation. As Coach Sumrall says about preparing a football team, it takes what it takes to get ready for the game. There's no shortcuts. It's not like you can uh, you can fudge on something and say, "Well, I'm not going to need that for the broadcast. I just won't fool with it," because as soon as you say that. You're going to need it for the broadcast and it comes up and you wish you had done it. So, you know, instead of, you know, a Saturday game, take Sunday off, go to church, relax, mow the grass. Uh, and then Monday, the press conference day, and you get your uh, game notes and your spotting charts. Uh, Tuesday, you start filling out your spotting charts. Wednesday, um, you get your last little bit. Thursday, uh, you, you know, you talk to the coaches and the coordinators and, and Friday, you set up the equipment at, uh, at the vet and, um, and get everything ready and test everything out. Well, you still have to do all that, with, except for two exceptions. Number one, the game is two days earlier. And number two, you don't get to set up your equipment early. I mean, you've got, you've got to travel. So one day, for us tomorrow, is a travel day. Me, Jerry, and Chris, and Junior, and Bob will all travel down there tomorrow. And, um, you know, the game is on Thursday. So in effect... You've got Sunday, and I work Sunday afternoon, Monday, Tuesday, and um, and that's it. We travel tomorrow. So it's the same amount of work, but it's a lot less time. Yeah, absolutely. I bet it is. And I kind of was kind of wondering that when I asked you last week to do this. I said, that's a good question, I think, because I asked, like I said, I asked this to coaches, mm-hmm. and they always say it's, it, it, you know, it, it is compacted. I well, wondered that from the broadcaster side. So it is yeah. very interesting. You talk uh, you talk to JD, and it's it's the same thing. It, it, for, for anybody – um, who takes himself seriously, you know, you, you don't ever want to, uh, y- again, you don't ever want to, uh, sell yourself short because then you'll end up selling your listeners short and you never want to do that. 
Yeah, I got a small taste, not at the level you guys are getting out, but I got a little taste of it down here because we're doing the dosing games. Mm -hmm. We had some yeah. games because of weather last minute get moved to a Thursday night. Well, I'm very routine based. So <laughs> I have a, and as the producer, I also do the school board show. I got to have stuff ready for our pregame and all that other stuff that I work on. So then it kind of, okay, so instead of doing that on Thursday night, getting everything, make sure I got everything right, I got to do Wednesday night. So, I, you know, it's, it is kind of, and that's a different si scenario when you yeah. get changed all of a sudden. So mm -hmm. it's, it is, you know, not to your degree, but still, it, I, I can understand a little bit of uh, the, the, it gets thrown everything together. Uh, but talk about this game on Thursday night. It's a big game. And I was thinking about this. Is this probably the, the most, the highest stakes battle for the belt game there has been in this, uh, in this rivalry? For both schools, absolutely. In, in terms of both, you know, Troy, I remember in 2017 when Troy beat LSU. Uh, and you know, the nation took notice and, you know, it was, it was one of the great moments. And then the next week, Troy came back home to the vet and lost to South Alabama. That was a big game for them. It was a huge loss for us, but really ultimately it didn't uh, knock us out of anything. Um, and it really didn't help South Alabama that much in terms of stakes going into the game. There's a lot of different levels that you can take a look at, Philip, and every one of them leads you to believe that this is the biggest buildup to a game that this uh, that this battle for the belt rivalry has had for a lot of different things. And Troy has won four in a row, um, and they're four and one all time in Mobile, and they take a lot of pride in that. Uh, but it, it's a you know it's a much better South Alabama team than we have maybe ever seen. Both teams are right at the top. Troy's win on Thursday, I mean, I'm sorry, last Saturday against Texas State kind of knocked Texas State back in the Sun Belt Conference West, which leads to some separation at the top of the division. South Alabama's only played two league games, and they've won them both. Troy has played four league games, and they've won three of the four. The only loss was that Hail Mary um, at Appalachian State. So, you know, this is for to be able to control, still control your destiny in the Western Division. It also, both Troy and South Alabama, South Alabama's 5-1, and one, Troy's 5-2. and two. A win in this game gets you bowl eligible. Now, I don't for a minute think that whoever wins this game is going to be their last win of the season, but it's certainly a, a benchmark of the program. Uh, number three, it is the battle for the belt, and that's a big deal. That's a big deal for Troy. Um, Troy has won four in a row in this deal, and certainly doesn't want to give it up. So in terms of national exposure, it's ESPNU. In terms of what it means in the league, a very, very tough league, this could be humongous. And in terms of bowl eligibility, this is a major step forward for one of the programs fortunate enough to win Thursday night. Yep, and for Troy, I mean, the last three seasons, they have been able to get to those, those five wins. You couldn't mm -hmm. get that, that six win to get to a bowl game. So, I mean, that's big for the program, too. If you get this win on Thursday night, then you've kind of, it's kind of like you've, you crossed that hurdle the last three seasons you weren't able to get past. And I kind of want to go back and now, John Summerall, we talked in the offseason, we previewed Troy, what to expect of this team. I think he's done a fantastic job first year. And I had Josh Boutwell on the show last week. Right. And I told him the thing I like about this team, they have a certain toughness about them. It the game may not be pretty, but they're going to find a way to win. And I like to with John Summerall, he fights for his players, and I think that is an impact. I think you see on the field. That's always been a cliche that you know a team takes on the personality of its coach, but most of the time it's true. And, and whether whether the personality is good or whether it's bad, <laughs> I'll, I'll, you know. I, a, 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 a team with a, with a coach who dwells on negativity and, and, and all of that tends to be a negative team, uh, a team that is uh, in which their leader exemplifies toughness and, you know, resilience. I think this team has been a really resilient team, though that when the team takes over that particular mindset, it can only help. And I think that's what's happened with uh, John Sumrall. He has been so relentlessly positive. He has he has demonstrated over and over again how much he cares for his team. You know, sometimes he's gotten two personal foul penalties this year. Sometimes mm -hmm. it has to do with uh, making his point to the referees. Sometimes it has to do with a player who um, maybe leaves because of the concussion protocol. 
maybe not playing that player, even if he clears the concussion protocol, just because you want to be extra sure. That's happened possibly a couple of times this year. So he always talks about playing with toughness, playing with relentlessness, but also playing with love. And there's a lot of that on this team, the the chemistry on this team, which has been carefully nurtured by Coach Sumrall and the staff, is really as good as maybe I've ever seen for a Troy football team. The point here also needs to be made is that the with the year head start, you can kind of see from my perch from afar the same kind of impact that Kane Womack has had at South Alabama. He has brought in a lot of players, transfer portal, um, you know, junior college, all of that. He has brought in a lot of players, and to this point, he's been able to really assimilate them into into what he wants, both on the field and in the locker room. So, you know, b- both of these coaches have done a terrific job so far with the X's and O's and, you know, and all of that. But it's also been, th- these are two big culture coaches. A- and for certain, John Sumrall is a culture type of coach. You know, in looking at this matchup, and you, well, you've got two of the best passing teams in the Sun Belt. I think a lot of people maybe that just look at a box score, just the score, may not think, I said, Troy, there have been some low scoring games. But they are number two in the Sun Belt in passing yards per game. And then and South Alabama against Louisiana Monroe show what they're capable of last week, 420 yards from their quarterback, Carter Bradley, had three receivers over 100 yards. Mm-hmm. But I look at it, I also look at their defenses. Both these are top five in the Sun Belt at points allowed per game. I know Troy, uh, they give up around 21 or 20, you know, in there. And then mm-hmm. uh, South Alabama's in the top five in that category as well, too. So I'm kind of wondering, you know, if we're going to have like a defensive game between the two teams, go for good defenses. So I guess I'll start it with this. Uh, when you look at Troy's offense going up against the South Alabama uh, defense, uh, what are your thoughts on that part of it? Well, the the thing that I that always strikes me whenever we talk about Troy's offense, again, seven games into the season, is that nobody intended it, nobody expected it to be like this. During the offseason, and you and I talked about this during the offseason, the, the focus was going to be run the football, be physical on the line of scrimmage, run the football, exert your will. And Troy's not done that. They simply have not. They've run the football well in the last three games, three straight games of over 100 yards. But that really has not been the, uh, the method of operation for this team. What has been is throwing the football. And with – the way this team um, has thrown the football as well as they have over the first little bit, it's the second best passing yardage performance by a Troy team through seven games in history. I wasn't sure I saw that. There's a couple of things to bear in mind. There have been two quarterbacks who have led to that. It's not a Carter Bradley kind of a deal where he's taken just about every mm-hmm. snap. Uh, <laughs> we've seen Gunnar Watson, and Watson's been really good. I think he's second or third in the league in pass yardage, but he's missed some time. He got hurt, uh, started against um, Texas State last weekend. Jared Dagey, who is as experienced as any quarterback in the country, uh, he came in late, late in fall, uh, started against Southern Miss, led Troy to a victory, came in late at Western Kentucky and had a hot fourth quarter and got Troy a victory there. Um, They're both skill set wise, virtually the same quarterback. They're both very experienced. And both of them have the confidence of the of the offensive team. So, yeah, offensively for Troy, it's been a lot different of a personality than I expected. Now, what it means uh, at South Alabama is going to be interesting because I like South Alabama's athletes in the secondary. Uh, I do think that um, I do think that Troy is going to be hampered a little bit. Some of the wide receivers have had injuries. Jabri Barber is not going to play. Uh, Tez Johnson sat out in the late in the game on Saturday. Same thing with Deshaun Stoudemire. Don't know their status yet, but I, I do like Troy's matchup if they can keep the quarterback upright. Troy has not been great this year in um, in protecting the quarterback. They, Troy leads the league and sacks given up. So. I know South Alabama is going to pin their ears back and come after Troy. That's what I would do. And the way to combat that is to run the football. That's something that's gotten better. It's something that certainly needs to happen for Troy. I will say this. If Troy can run the football against South Alabama and the Troy defense 
plays like they have played over the last three games. Uh, they've held three opponents to less than 300 yards this year of total offense. There's not many teams in the nation that have done that. If Troy's defense plays up to their potential and Troy can run the football on, on offense, I do think South Alabama is going to have a difficult time beating Troy. Yeah, absolutely. I don't want to correct myself. Troy is allowing 19.3 points a game. I, I, I was looking up my, my stats. <laughs> my stats here wrong uh, on the uh, on the Troy defense, but the Troy defense on their side. Of course, you got Carlton Marshall over there. I mean, they've got stars all over the place. You got TJ Jackson uh, leading the team in sacks. You've got, you know, Willie Chill up front. You got Craig Slocum. I mean, I could name off the entire defense, and, and it would just wow you with what Troy does. One of the best again at getting to the quarterback. And that's going to be big because you're going up against a team in South Alabama uh, that can throw the ball. So that that's a, an interesting thing on the Troy side when they play on when they're on defense against South Alabama offense. It's probably easier to to reel off the names on the Troy defense, Philip, because they've they've been together for so long. Uh, you mm-hmm. know, it's an experienced defense. Carlton Marshall, Craig Slocum, they're the top two tacklers. Slocum is the free safety. And it's interesting to note that those two guys, the top two tacklers, are both former walk-ons that have really worked and gotten the the job done. But yeah, you're right. When you when you when you look at what Troy has been able to do on defense, they've got experience, they've got some depth on defense, and that has really helped out a lot. But the thing that has really it certainly helped out Slocum and the DBs, that experienced group of defensive backs, is they've been able to get after the quarterback quite a bit last year Troy knocked Jake Bentley out of the game uh for South Alabama two years ago Troy just got after Desmond Trotter and um they weren't able to really get their footing underneath them at all in either of those Troy has been really good they didn't get any any sacks against Texas State Texas State was able to get the ball out quickly uh, and they were able to um you know, to get a bunch of, a bunch of you know short passes here and there. They never were able to test Troy deep at all in the game. But um, you know, maybe that's something South Alabama will look at because if I'm if if I look at Carter Bradley and he's been so efficient this year, he's been a real godsend for that offense. If I look at Carter Bradley and see him standing tall in the pocket uh, with room to throw to the Colin Lacy's and to the um, you know and to the Jalen Waynes and those guys. I'm not going. I'm not going to like Troy's chances in that. Uh, they've got to get after him early and often. Yeah, the, I, I looked at that and I, I was watching. I watched both games from last mm-hmm. week. I watched South Alabama's game and I watched uh, Troy. I actually watched Troy's last night as we're recording this on Tuesday. So it really stuck out to me. So I'm going to end this with a question, not a prediction. Okay. But if Troy comes out victorious on Thursday night, I tell you that now. What happened? For Troy, to, if we drive back from Mobile with a song in our heart and and uh, <laughs> a smile on our faces, it will be because the defense was able to control uh, the tempo as much as and by control the tempo, I mean dictate um, what South Alabama is able to do. They got to pop around Carter Bradley a good bit, like I said. They've got a really good running back, Ladamian Webb, who was actually you know on Troy's campus, was a Troy student at one time, uh, he's going to do what he's going to do. Uh, but I do think the, the best chance for South Alabama to score against Troy will be through the air. And the best chance for Troy to counteract that would be to make sure that Carter Bradley is on the ground as much as Troy can possibly do it. I, I don't think there's any question. Troy is going to do their best to get after him as often as they can. If they do that and, and can be efficient on offense, then I think Troy can win the game. Well, it's gonna be fun. I'm gonna be uh, I'm gonna be here in Dothan, sitting in front of my TV, uh, watching game. But if anybody wanted to listen uh, uh, to Detroit broadcast and I mean follow you online too as well, where where can they find all that stuff? Well, in the Dothan area, you can you can listen on the ball. That's that's for sure. But for people who are you know watching this podcast all throughout the the um, the area, uh, the best thing to do there's a Troy Athletics app that has the broadcasts. Uh, you can also uh, listen on on the TuneIn app by searching our flagship station WTXK. The morning show that I do with John Longshore, he and I have been doing it together for 25 years in Montgomery. Like you mentioned, seven to ten, you can listen on Sports Radio 740 in Montgomery. There's a Sports Radio 740 app, and also you can always check it out online at SportsRadio740.com. 
All right, sounds good, Barry. It's going to be a lot of fun on Thursday night. Uh, I know for you calling the game, it's going to be it's going to be great. And uh, wish you for a, a great broadcast on Thursday night. And uh, I appreciate you taking out some time in the busy week. And I uh, hope we can do some again sometime down the road. All you got to do is ask, Philip. I'd be glad to do it. I always enjoy it. All right, everybody. Now that was the Detroit side of the big game battle for the belt. Now let's jump over to get the South Alabama side of the game for tonight. And now here's my conversation with J.D. Byers, the voice of the South Alabama Jaguars. All right, everybody, joining me next, now getting the home team perspective of the battle for the belt. I'm joined by J.D. Byers, the South Alabama Director of Broadcasting. And, uh, J.D., I appreciate you coming on the show and a preview of the big game for Thursday night. Thanks. Uh, you know, I, I hate that I have to follow Barry McKnight. You know, he's a, he's the legend here. Oh, no, no. You both guys are good. But uh, I appreciate both of you coming on. This is uh, something I've always wanted to do with this rivalry is I uh, have a podcast where I do a preview where I've got both sides of it. And just, you know, what, what's the buzz in Mobile? Uh, South Alabama, they're the home team. Just beat the second straight game on national television. Was on the NFL Network this past Saturday. What's, uh, what's the buzz going around in Mobile? You know, it's the success, Philip, um, because the only loss of the year was the one-point loss at UCLA on a last-second field goal. South Alabama had the two-point lead late and are that close to being undefeated right now. Uh, and then the polls come out this week, and you see South Alabama in there receiving votes, which is, uh, you know, I think the first time in school history. So I think there's a lot of expectation and hope that if South Alabama could win this one, uh, you may even see, at least in one of the polls, maybe South Alabama cracks the top 25. Um, and, you know, it may happen in one poll, not the other, but I think we take either one right now. Um, it's going to be harder said than done because anybody can beat anybody in this league, and it's been very topsy-turvy. Uh, you know, who saw Texas State beating App State a couple of weeks ago, mm -hmm. and then Troy turns around and beats Texas State in a low-scoring game. But the South Alabama contingent's very happy with what's going, a three-game win streak. And one of the headlines of this is you've got the two longest win streaks in the entire Sun Belt meeting Thursday night. Yeah, and going into this year, you know, with South Alabama, they are five and one. Uh, won five games all of last year. Oh, uh, what's what's been uh, the key to success early on for uh, for Kane Womack now in a you know, year and a half on the job there, at South Alabama? You know, from my perspective, uh, since he got there, he preaches a neutral mindset he wants his players to be ready and be focused uh and want to win but don't get so high and so excited when things are good or when you're most pumped you're most motivated uh and, and play that uh, roller coaster to where when there's lows or there's adversity you get too down and things just go from bad to worse so he he, he wants his team to have a neutral mindset but then, you know, as time progresses from year one to year two, he was able to recruit at a high level and then go find out what they needed at key positions. And I think the biggest need in the offseason was offensive linemen. And just seeing them on the hoof when they go by, it's a totally different breed. Uh, they're bigger, uh, they're stronger, they're faster. Many, if not all, that came in had Division One and uh, Power Five experience. So they have been a really big addition. But the other thing during uh, fall camp especially is watch Tim put an offense and a defense in situational downs and really challenge them. So, you know, two minutes to go and he started your own 18. Or I even saw him, you know, you've got to pick up two first downs, but you start at your own one-yard line as you only have a four-point lead. Are you going to be able to dig down and do what it takes – to suck it up and get that first down and force the other team to take timeouts. And he shows them why that's important. Uh, so I, I think you could say, well, uh, uh, the coach isn't doing time management. Coach knows how to time time manage and, and manage a clock, but it's on the team out there actually playing the downs to execute and make mm -hmm. that plan happen. You know, uh, going into this game, and like I said, this is one of my favorite games to do uh, and watch, and I'll be comfortably sitting in my, my chair on Thursday night watching this one. But I And I asked Barry this question, and I asked this question because I do a high school football podcast here in the Dutton area too, and whenever a yeah. coach has goes into a Thursday night situation, as a broadcaster, how, how does that change things up for you getting ready uh, to do the game on Thursday night? 
Well, first, I'm hoping that my wife is not somewhere secretly putting together a list of chores. Hey, since you're off this weekend, <laughs> uh, hey, guess what? You're going to come go uh, shopping, grocery shopping with us this weekend. Uh, and by the way, I do have some things I got to do now. But it also uh, is appealing because you go, hey, man, I get to watch some college football myself this time. I don't have to you know, spend all the time getting in and out of a hotel and and making sure the entire broadcast team is there and we're going to get everything set up and everything's going to work like it should. And we have all the signals and the frequencies. So I, I like a Thursday game, especially at home, because then, you know, when the game's over Thursday, you just go home and you've got a three day weekend waiting on you. That is, mm-hmm. if you're not already in basketball season and the sports are overlapping. So I, I, I like it. Um, this is unique in that the scheduling, which is done by the conference, they didn't build any time going into it for either school. So Troy may have gotten the worst part of this because they're the team having to travel and, uh, you know, leave a day early and also not spend the night in their own bed. So uh, there may be a little bit of advantage right there for the Jags and, and home field advantage too. But um, both teams are, are accustomed to playing on big stages and in very hostile environments. And they've also won in hostile environments. So um, it, it's unique in that it's a battle for a belt, and that's the trophy. And it's just going to be fun to see who uh, is able to stay unbeaten in the league when it's all over. You know, it kind of felt weird the last two seasons. I believe the last two seasons this game was played on a Saturday. Just kind of getting back to that during the week seems like it is the uh, the tradition is back on that because it just seems like this has always been a game played on, on a weekday, not on a Saturday. Yeah, and you know, I always thought that, Philip, what would make most sense is uh, – why not make this a rivalry Friday day after Thanksgiving, like Black Friday? Mm-hmm. Because, okay, it's Thanksgiving. Who do you really want to put out when you schedule games in the conference? You know, if you can keep teams close, you know, by their campus, which Troy and South Alabama are only, you know, two and a half hours away, uh, or a South Alabama and a Mississippi, I'm sorry, a Southern Miss, uh, Seems like that would make really good sense to do that on the day after Thanksgiving. I'm sorry the car lights have things going on and off in here. I'm just outside my daughter's swim meet. But uh, the, the, the game has been moved to Thursday so many times. I think we even played it on a Wednesday one year just because there's kind of a national uh, interest and curiosity about it because it's an in-state rivalry game, but it's not at the Power 5 level. But it's cool because they have this battle for the belt, and it kind of sets up nicely for uh, two teams that are down in the most richest part of America as far as football goes. Amen on that. I agree with you 100% on that one, absolutely. Uh, and like I said, looking at this game, and then I'm I looking at this, I think this is probably, you know, with, with both teams. And I yeah. know this is – we're in the middle of the season, you know, because but it feels like this game could have a lot of say-so who wins that side of the conference. And it really feels like this is probably the biggest stakes game uh, between these two in this rivalry. You know, from a South Alabama perspective, perspective is if South Alabama could win this one and then at least win the Arkansas State game, is South Alabama could be in a position uh, and put themselves in a very good position to own tie breaks versus those two teams that could be sneaking up from the back in the second half of the season being Louisiana or Troy. Uh, and Arkansas State's playing pretty well. Now, the Jags do have a road trip right after the Arkansas State game to go play a team over from the east, being Georgia Southern. But, and knock on wood, if those things line up, because South Alabama is 2-0 and in the conference, could be cracking the top 25 if they win one or maybe two more, if South Alabama could find themselves not only for the first time in program history in the Sunbelt Championship game, but hosting the Sunbelt Championship game. And I think that's one of the other things that has Mobile in this region along the the upper Gulf Coast, very excited. Yeah, absolutely. That's one thing I do like about Sunbelt is, you know, of course, the bigger conferences, yes, they have the neutral site game. But, I mean, it, it adds a little extra with the get – make sure you get that home field advantage. If you, you have the best record, you get to win that thing in front of your home fans. And that that's that would be a cool feeling, I think, for any athlete, any level. You get to win. You know, we see it in other sports, in professional sports, in baseball, basketball, and hockey. You get to win in front of your fans. That's got, you know, I think, you know, for South Alabama, or even if you want to look at the Troy side, anybody in the conference, if you get to win something in front of your fans, that's, got, that's going to be a special feeling for the players if they are able to do that down the road. Oh, exactly. And um, you take into account, the fact that from a league perspective, you got to put that game on. 
there's a lot of logistics from signage, uh, hospitality, uh, how you're going to activate it from sponsorship to the league level, television. Television would love it being at uh, the new Hancock Whitney Stadium just because how modern it is. Um, and it's all plug and play, which makes it very easy for a national TV crew to come in. Uh, but Sunbelt Group of Five, and not knocking our league, we have some really good member institutions that when they play at home have some really good passionate crowds. But if you went to neutral site, I just don't think it would work. Uh, it, it's not like an SEC where they can go to Atlanta and more than likely, regardless of who's playing in it, they're going to be packed to the roof. Uh, if you move this to a 30,000 seat stadium somewhere in between or somewhere in the footprint of the Sun Belt, I'm just afraid you might, you know, open the doors and kick the thing off in front of seven or 8,000 people. Just, be, you know, it's expensive these days. Gas is high, plane tickets are high. If you could even get a flight right now, plus mm-hmm. you got the expense of hotel rooms and we're in a recession and inflation uh, right now. So, I think it benefits uh, the fans of at least one of the schools, but absolutely the Sunbelt Conference. Because if you kick this thing off on national TV and they're going to give you a, a, a prime day part, which could actually be on ABC, that's part of the ESPN family, you mm-hmm. want to see a lot of fans so that people don't tune in to watch your league's championship and think, well, where is everybody? Uh, that, that, that is true. Um Looking at this game uh, for for Thursday night, I almost said Saturday, just have a habit. But the, looking forward to this uh, this game on Thursday uh, night, of course, national broadcast on ESPNU. Uh, first, just looking at you know when you look at the South Alabama offense versus Detroit defense. Detroit defense. I mean, there's a lot of guys over there that you look at the the leaders in the Sun Belt High. I mean, obviously the, the name Carlton Marshall, T.J. Jackson, Craig Slocum. I can go on. on. But South Alabama was really good on offense. Our average is like around 36 points per game. And what their performance this past uh, Saturday against losing Monroe, uh, Carter Bradley had a big game, 420 yards, three touchdowns, three receivers over 100 yards. So when, when you look at uh, the South Alabama offense against Detroit uh, defense, what are some matchups, what are some keys there for South Alabama to be successful on Thursday night? Well, ULM was missing two things. And those two things were named Richard Jubinor and TJ Jackson. Um, uh, I'll tell you what, uh, I was doing some of the charts and some of the comparisons and, and on, on the, on the spotter charts, just for quick reference, I like to make it a, uh, we'll call it a, a habit comparison. And now keep in mind, Troy has played one more game than South Alabama, but the total TFLs tackle for loss, total sacks and quarterback hurries is Troy's almost two to one better than South Alabama. That's the impact their defense has. Because they just held a, a good Texas State club to only 14 points and maybe scoreless the second half. And that's the same Texas State team that beat App State and didn't have too much trouble doing it. And App mm-hmm. State's kind of held the the torch for a long time in the Sunbelt Conference. Uh, they're a team that can break on the ball. Carlton Marshall's the quarterback. Man, they're front four when they're in that even front. They're as good as anybody. And um, I don't know if the second half – of the SEC teams have as good a defensive front as Troy does. Um, so that that's kind of their defensive stat that stood out to me. Uh, the play of their corners, you know, and who came in, who their additions were. And they've got their own share of Power 5 transfers. Juvenor is a good example. Not his first year with Troy, but he started his career out at Auburn. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's true. Uh, oh, what's been your, your takeaway with quarterback uh, Carter Bradley for or for South Alabama? You know how he has played. You know as the season when has gone on, he's competitive, and I think if there was one thing that he could and wanted to and has gotten better at working on, is going back to that topic I told you earlier on a neutral mindset because he can get up, get anxious, and get giddy. Like I want to, I want, I want to go down. No, 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 no. Let's get down the field. Uh, but I'll tell you this, when it comes down to tools, uh, everybody thinks they got the greatest quarterback. Everybody thinks they have the quarterback with the best arm in school history. I've seen a lot of football. I've been doing this 30 years. This guy can make all the throws. Uh, and when he misses, he tends to miss in the right area. Uh, so, so, you know, over the, over the boundary. And if I miss, I'm going to miss out of bounds. But he can make those throws rolling left, right arm quarterback in a bootleg or the waggle plays, we call some of those variations. Uh, if anything, he may need to take a little bit off of it when he's throwing it just to underneath the linebackers. These guys are getting 90-mile-per-hour bullets, and but that's him getting anxious. 
but the guy's got an arm to make a long, if he's on the left hash mark, throwing to the right boundary on an out pattern where it's only going to be four, year, four yards downfield, but the ball travels 40 yards in the air, that mm -hmm. thing barely gets off the ground. I mean, he can just throw a dart. So, uh, you know, will he have the time to get all those throws off, though, I think will be the big question mark. Because you can have all these storylines about it's the it's the two teams with the longest win streaks, South at three, Troy at four. It's South Alabama looking for redemption and trying to get back in the win column for the first time in four years, yada, yada. But I think the matchup is, does Carter Bradley have time with that heavy rush that Troy's been so lethal with? Yeah, you know, looking on the other side, the South Alabama defense, they're really good too. Um, Troy's only averaging 24.3 points per game. South Alabama's a top five. Uh, team giving up points, and th these both are top five defenses too in the Sun Belt. Really good. Uh, Troy's number two in passing. They're like I said, their points per game may not. Some people may look at that and say, okay, but they're second pass. But they are uh, with two quarterbacks, Gunnar Watson, Garrett Deggy. But also South Alabama, like I said, they're really good there. So that matchup with the South Alabama defense against the Troy offense. What do you like there? And kind of like the same question on offense. What what will be the keys for the uh, for South Alabama defense to have success uh, and come out and help the team come out with a victory on Thursday night? Well, we do, and this is just looking at a recent uh, matchup where South Alabama's defense showed a hole. Was ULM came in with an amazing amount of explosives, so the game plan looks simple enough. Don't give up the explosive. Well, that sounded easy to do, except they got a guy named Howell. And the guy's speed, he just hits another gear. And he rips off, I think, three touchdowns. And two of them uh, made the quarterback look really good on yards per completion because this guy caught these on, like, little slip screens. He was no more than a yard downfield. And he scored from, like, 74 and 71 yards. And South Alabama let him get behind him. Uh, if South Alabama keeps explosives in front of them, Here's a stat to think about when you watch this game is as a team gets down inside the red zone against South Alabama, the Jags may have even moved into the top 10, but I know going into the ULM game, we're in the top 15 in America in red zone defense. So as that field starts to shrink and the secondary and the defense of these corners don't have to play so much with a buffer, they all of a sudden become a lot more effective. Teams are being forced to go for you know field goals. Or if they're playing from behind, they're forced to go forward on fourth and intermediate without a whole lot of success. But if Troy's able to score on some explosives, it could be a totally different night. I was looking, you know, Troy only got in the red zone one time against Texas State. But they scored one time in the red zone, their only trip, and that was a field goal. The rest of the scores were on big plays. So the explosives seem to be how you get a how you attack a South Alabama defense with success. So uh, before I let you go, my final question with this, and I, I, I asked uh, this in the first part too with Barry McKnight, the game is over. South Alabama has won. I tell you that. I tell you that here. What do you think happened? I think South Alabama is able to establish the run and doing it in the teeth of a heavy rush because many times when people stack the box or they're going to try to force you to be uncomfortable or they want to bring such a heavy rush where you can't, get your timing down to throw. All you've got to do against a heavy rush when people say they bring more than you can block, you've only got to get by it about because there's nobody at the next level. Whereas if somebody rushes four and there's linebackers there, you don't get a big run. You have a higher propensity of getting a big rush per run against a rush than you do against a non-rush because linebackers can come up if that makes sense. So if South Alabama is able to establish the run game, which they did against ULM with minus their number one and number two running backs. LaDamian Webb, the Florida State transfer, went out after in the first quarter after the first series with only one carry. He had an upper abdominal or rib-type injury. Raylan McReynolds was injured early in the Louisiana game. So I don't know if either one of those are going to be ready for the Troy game. Uh, the two guys who came in and ran pretty well uh, looked good against ULM. But now, on top of that, Troy's defense has to worry about the three receivers who all caught passes totaling 100 yards plus each for a school record. Mm -hmm. However many yards Carter Bradley threw for and 600 plus yards of offense. So South Alabama would have to get out in front, stay out in front, uh, and prevent the explosives. And I think if they do that, that would be how they would rack up a win against Troy and get that 
uh, belt back in Mobile, Alabama. Yeah, because it's uh, Troy has won four straight. I know they are seven and three in this, so I know it would be a big, a big win for the program there at South Alabama. Continue what they've been doing this year, uh, being very successful, and uh, heading toward uh, perhaps being uh, uh, representing and uh, winning the Sun Belt this year. And uh, JD, this has been a lot of fun uh, having you on the show. I know first time me and you have done this. Of uh, listeners, viewers, if they want to listen to the South Alabama uh, broadcast on Thursday night, how can they do so, and how can they follow you too? Uh, so in and around Dothan, we have a radio affiliate there. Um, and I'm trying to remember if that's on 104.9. We're also on WRVR up in Montgomery and Troy that gets into Prattville. But then we also have the affiliate in Dothan. But then anywhere else in America, uh, I think we have 13 radio stations across the state uh, who carry South Alabama football. I heart iHeart's free. That's my favorite kind. If it's free, it's for me. <laughs> so many of the apps aren't free these days, but you can go on iHeartRadio and uh, put in Sports Talk 99.5 for South Alabama Jaguars, but uh, we're able, you, you can listen that way as well. And, you know, we have a lot of fun. Uh, we put together a, a, an award-winning broadcast. We're pretty proud of it. Uh, but, you know, the same, same thoughts are there with, with what Barry and uh, those guys are doing. Because even though this is a, a bitter rival, it's still a familiar rival and a familiar foe. And when you've been around a program long, because the, the players and the kids will come and go, and they'll always hate the other school, but it's almost like family because you're that close. So, like, you know, Barry and Jerry Miller, they're, uh, they're like family. They're like brothers. Uh, they are great ambassadors for Troy. We love them to death. And, of course, you know, the athletic director and Adam Pendergrass up there as well, who's a, an associate AD, are just great, great friends. I consider them family. Uh, when things go bad, uh, you know, I don't mind sharing some personal information. I lost my daughter. My I lost my sister and my father within about 13 months of each other. And the very first cards and texts and phone calls I got were from Barry McKnight and Jerry Miller. Awesome, awesome, and I have always felt like that. It, it, it's a rivalry, but it's a friendly rivalry. It's not oh, yeah, you know, yeah. nasty at, at any point between the two programs, and uh, that it is going to be a, a fun time. The game Thursday night. I'm looking forward to it. And uh, JD, once again, I appreciate you taking time out coming on on the show to talk about the South Alabama side. And I hope we can do this again sometime down the road. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Uh, I appreciate you reaching out to me, and we'll see what happens Thursday. But I got to get a go Jags in there before we wrap up. All right, everybody, and uh, once again, thanks to Barry McKnight and J.D. Byers for being on the show. Of course, I've had uh, Barry on several times. It was my first time having uh, J.D. here on the show. We appreciate both of them taking time. Obviously, a busy week, a uh, jam-packed week for both of them, getting ready for a Thursday night game, especially on the Barry side, having to do the travel. Uh, but I do appreciate both guys coming on the show and uh, giving that time and to talk about both these teams and this really uh, fun rivalry and uh, kind of what to expect out of this game. Uh, tonight thursday night you know, hopefully hope you don't listen to this on friday because it's, it's a preview podcast uh but it should be a lot of fun in that game so i told you guys on the top i was going to give my pick for the game and you know I, i've looked at this game i think it's a good quarterback matchup between whoever is playing for troy is, is it gunner watson is it jared Dagey? and then you got carter bradley on the other side who's played really really well for south alabama as well and both teams are really good on defensive side of the ball and Troy's really good at getting to the quarterback. Uh, Troy can create turnovers. Uh, they have a lot of top guys when you look at their defense. I mean, obviously, we know about Carlton Marshall. And South Alabama's got some guys on their side, too, as well. And they've got receivers galore. And it's just a lot of talent, a lot of even matchups at certain points. But I think this matchup could come down to the running game. And I, I believe while South Alabama's running backs are well – for one, they're banged up. I, they have shown the ability to be able to run the ball, I think, with more than one back this season. Troy has struggled in that. Now, they don't give up on the run. Uh, they keep going. They're leading rushers, uh, D.K. Billingsley, so far this year. And neither quarterbacks really – they can run, but not a true running threat. Neither one of them is that. I, this is hard because, you know, for anybody – especially for anybody that's a South Alabama – uh, fan listening to this or watching this, I, I'm not far from Troy. As we talked about, I'm in Dothan, so I'm not too far from Troy. So I do have a somewhat of connection with that program. And so 
Uh, my heart wants to say Detroit Trojans are going to win this game, but I am going to actually go – I'm going to pick uh, South Alabama to win this game. I think it's a close game. I really do. Um, it's just the run game. They, they have that advantage there. I think both these teams are c- pretty close passing. I mean, Troy's the second-best passing team in the Sun Belt, and they're both good defensively. And I know last week South Alabama had some points put on them uh, with losing Monroe, but it's the run game. It's the home game situation for South Alabama. I think this thing's going to come down to the final minutes between these two, though. I think it's going to be one, one terrific football game. It's going to be worth the watch. So go watch this game on Thursday night. It's on ESPN News 630, but – I think South Alabama wins by a field goal a margin, three points. Like I said, very, very slim margin. Um, wouldn't be surprised if Troy wins this game, but I'm going to go with South Alabama uh, to pull this one. Very close game. Probably, I, I think they win this game 27-24. That's where I'm, I, I'm leaning on this one. So, uh, any of my Troy friends, I'm sorry. Don't don't unfriend me. Don't get mad at me. Don't block me. Don't unsubscribe to the podcast. But uh, that's just – a counter lean. If this game was being played in Troy, I probably would pick Troy. That's just how close it is. I mean, I really struggled. Um, Wednesday, I, I was really thinking on this game a lot during the day, and I was really thinking, who who do I want to pick? And it, it's really tough. It's, it really is tough to decide who I think was going to win this one. But we'll see. Uh, it should be fun on Thursday. And uh, I hope everybody will check it out. And I'll be back next week with some more sports goodness here on the Philip Jordan Podcast. Please go check out Talking SEC on Monday through Thursday. Uh, if you're listening to this on Thursday morning, later on Thursday, probably it may be in the evening time, but I'll be releasing the preview pod for the SEC Week 8. Uh, so please check that out. Check out the Wiregrass High School Football Report every week as well. Uh, that's where I cover all things high school football in the Wiregrass, see what's going on there. Uh, of course, you can read all my work over at Last Word on College Football. And I'm part of the Dustin Wolves broadcasting on 96.9 The Legend. Where I'm the in-studio host and producer. Dustin Wolves got a big game on Friday night against Opelika. Uh, so playoff atmosphere should be expected uh, at Rip Hughes on Friday night when the Dustin Wolves host the Opelika Bulldogs. Well, guys, I appreciate you checking out the show. I appreciate, once again, Barry McKnight and J.D. Byers for coming on the show. And I hope everybody has a great rest of the week. Has a great weekend. And I'll talk to you guys next week. You've been listening to the Phil Jordan Podcast.